You are indeed watching Breakthrough News, and this is the Freedom Side Live. I'm one of your hosts, Eugene Perrier, here as always, at least virtually, alongside Rania Kalik. Rania, great to be back with you. Great to be with you, Eugene. Are you able to hear me? Because I feel like there's a huge delay. I actually hear you loud and clear. There is a little bit of it. Move your head, nod your head. Okay. There it okay. is. Now okay, it's now good. we're I was like, It took a second to catch up. Yeah, there yeah. we go. All right. <laughs> blink I don't know twice what that was if about. you're being held hostage. Uh, <laughs> okay. Shoot, shoot. Now I can't stop blinking. Okay. I'm going to give you're mixed just, signals here. God, I feel like we're in Argo or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, moving on. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Very happy to have you with us here on the show again, as we always are every week. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, this is a great opportunity for you to go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Also hit the bell so you can get the alerts. I was going to say share it. You should also definitely share it wherever you're watching any platform. But if you're on another platform, it might be also a good time to go over to YouTube and make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you can get alerts so you can get all of the fantastic content that we are putting out here on Breakthrough News, including Rania Kalik Dispatches. Fantastic interviews mm -hmm. that come out on a regular basis. So yes, subscribe, get the alerts, and wherever you may be, Definitely share so that everyone who is following you can be following us. We've got a ton on the show, as we always do. Of course, we're going to be talking about Afghanistan later in the show. We're going to be talking about policing in Atlanta. Still racist, still brutal, but some very interesting things and some very interesting organizing going on. We're going to be talking to a socialist running for mayor in New York City. Very exciting stuff. And, of course... We're also going to be updating folks on the situation in Haiti, which, of course, has faced the devastating earthquake and the tropical storm that has caused a number of other complications and the overall tragic situation there, as well as the man-made disaster of neoliberalism that is just exacerbating it all. So hit the share button so everyone's following you can follow us. Subscribe on YouTube. Hit the bell. Get the alerts on YouTube. Speaking of crises, Rania who you yeah. are with us as many people who know. If you're just watching this show for the first time, Rania is in Beirut. I'm in New York City. And where you are right now in Lebanon, I mean, the interesting thing, and I'm curious what you think about this, the way it's even described in the West is as if there's an economic crisis in Lebanon. It seems like that's, in a way, kind of a soft sell of what's going on there. There's a major crisis with electricity and, and other pieces. Uh, today, there was a lot of things that happened, Rania, in terms of the issue of the fuel crisis, fuel coming from Iran, fuel coming from the West. Uh, maybe just update us a little bit on the situation there in Lebanon, where I know there's everything from hospitals potentially shutting down to the electricity being off. I mean, it seems quite dire. Not even potentially. Some hospitals in the country have shut down because they don't have access to fuel because the mm. state electricity... Uh, power grid is essentially non-functional at this point due to a lack of fuel. Uh, due to an economic crisis, the country doesn't have money to buy fuel. This is how it's portrayed in the mainstream media, and it's partially accurate. But as we've talked about on the show before, you know, Lebanon is essentially under this kind of unofficial siege. Um, the Lebanon is not isolated from the events in the region uh, that surrounds it. Lebanon neighbors Syria which is under the most crippling sanctions in the world at the moment, where Syria can't even purchase fuel. Syria can't even purchase medicines. Um, these, the Caesar Act that is really, you know, it's a crime against humanity, just completely decimating the country and destroying what's left of that society following the decade-long uh, U.S., Saudi, Turkish, Qatari, every country war on Syria. Um, and these sanctions impact Lebanon. Lebanon's a tiny country. So Syria on one side, Lebanon can't do trade. Lebanon can't, not only can Lebanon not purchase power from Syria, one of the issues of getting power, because it's there's an economic crisis and Lebanon doesn't have the dollars to buy fuel, is Egypt and Jordan were trying to help send gas to Lebanon. However, they would have to send that gas through Syria. And on the way through Syria, they would have to pay the Syrian government transit fees. 
Well, those transit fees would violate American sanctions and mm. subject them to secondary sanctions, wow. which is what's prevented that gas from reaching Lebanon, right? On the other side, you have the, the Beirut port, which exploded last year, uh, you know, making it more difficult for Lebanon to import things on top of the economic issue. But there's also the issue of, you know, Lebanon is also, you know, uh, in the neighborhood of Iran, which has a lot of fuel. It's the kind of fuel that actually works in Lebanon's power infrastructure. So Iran offered to essentially give Lebanon fuel almost for free. They would sell it in the local currency, which is almost worthless. Mm. And Lebanon had to say no because they were threatened by the Americans. If you accept, if you buy even one liter of Iranian fuel, we will sanction you. A country wow. that's already experiencing an economic meltdown. So this is just situation just been snowballing. You know, when there's fuel shortages for a short period of time, it can paralyze a country. This has been going on all summer. And Lebanon is running out of fuel. There's also, you know, monopolies connected to political parties that have cartels that are hoarding fuel and then smuggling it and selling it for higher prices. But the point is, everything's collapsing. When you don't have fuel, you can't power generators, which everyone's depending on right now. So hospitals are relying on generators as well. Hospitals are starting to shut down. Bakeries are shutting down. Restaurants are shutting down. Grocery stores can't put fuel in their trucks to transport food to bring it to the grocery store. So you can't transport food anymore. The water pu uh, pump system in the country is on the brink of collapse because water mm. pumps also rely on fuel to function. So it's just this disastrous situation. So this morning, uh, it's Ashura, which is a Shia holiday. So Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, gave a speech this morning. And in his speech commemorating Ashura, he said, we've had it. This is like too much humiliation. Lebanon's under siege by the West and its local partners. That's it. Like we're putting our foot down. We cannot allow people to suffer to this degree in the scorching heat and have no hospitals and bakeries. So we are accepting a, uh, uh, several ships of Iranian fuel. And he told the Americans and Israelis, uh, once this uh, ship leaves Lebanon, it leaves leaves Iran's port, it is Lebanese soil. So keep that in mind should you decide to attack it. And that's essentially saying if you attack this shit, ship, Lebanon will be will be forced to respond and it'll start a war. So wow. within hours of this uh, statement, right? Within hours, the U.S. ambassador in Lebanon called the Lebanese president and said the U.S. is going to do everything it can to get that Egyptian and Jordanian gas through mm. Syria to Lebanon as immediately as possible. So, you know, it was a really good move on Hezbollah's part, and I hope that it definitely alleviates the situation in the country. That said, what people need to understand, Lebanon has very complicated politics that you can't really, I, I suggest people go watch the uh, episode I did with Jamal Zassin, who's a journalist at the leftist newspaper in Lebanon, El Akhbar. We talked extensively and broke down the con the situation in Lebanon. But what Westerners, Americans especially, should take away from the situation here is it's not as complicated as it seems. Lebanon is being squeezed because Lebanon is home to Hezbollah, which challenges Israeli and U.S. and Saudi hegemony in the region. And as we know, that can't be tolerated. And whenever any movement challenges American imperialism, uh, it is crushed. And it doesn't matter right. how many casualties and average people are crushed along with it. And that's what's happening in Lebanon right now. Wow, well, thank you for that. It was very <laughs> succinct. And, Lots and of information. <laughs> No, no, lots of information, but I think important information. I mean, Lebanon is, is sort of physically a small country. I think in the broader politics of the region, it sometimes gets lost in the popular conversation. Obviously, because of what's going on in Afghanistan, I think the story has kind of been secondary, secondary in many ways. But, you know, seeing what's coming out there, I think it's very important. And it really underlines the point you're making about, you know, resistance and the role of Hezbollah, that as soon as they said, we're going to take this oil, Rather than challenge them, the U.S. said, okay, 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 fine. Uh, and it does sort of speak to the power dynamics in the region. But, uh, well, uh, uh, that's what's happening now. Are you expecting sort of an easing of the crisis at this point? Or is this perhaps just an interlude until the next phase? I think it's the the latter. I mean, I expect a temporary easing of the crisis, particularly as the summer heat calms down a little bit and we go into the fall. There won't be as much of ten as much tension on the electrical system. And it does sound like there's going to be fuel coming from a different a few different sources. So that'll get Lebanon, I think, through the next few months. I mean, the winter time is going to be very difficult. Um, so you know, we'll have to wait and see. But the crisis remains uh, and no one's being held accountable for it, largely because America and France are protecting the people who crashed the economy because it's their 
it's their puppets essentially right. that crashed the economy in Lebanon. So for there to be accountability, it would mean their puppets and their clients in this country being held accountable. Uh, and they can't lose that. They've invested too much in these people. So they're actually actively right now, uh, you know, Lebanon's not a sovereign country. Its sovereignty is violated every day by these Western embassies. Mm -hmm. um, and the American embassy, it's not some normal diplomatic mission. The American embassy does nothing but meddle in Lebanese internal affairs in order to try to you know, force things in their direction. And so they're the ones who are obstructing a government formation. They're the ones who are obstructing the financial audit of the central bank. And until those things happen, nothing in Lebanon is gonna change. Wow. Well, it's certainly gonna be interesting to see how this all continues to play out. And certainly um, it's much to the benefit of ourselves and our viewers that you were right there to be able to, to cover it as terrible as it is. But yes, crisis in Lebanon. Also the interview you did recently on Dispatch is uh, very, very well worth watching. But thank you for that for that update, Rania. We're going to shift. Of course, of course. Of course, of course. Uh, oh, it looks like we got our first Super Chat. Uh, don't forget, if you want to donate in the Super Chat, we will potentially read your comment and shout you out. But you have to get past our censor, Rania, who will determine <laughs> whether or not your comment is in fact legitimate and able to be read. But uh, Bobby Rasuli just threw in some money. Thank you. Shout out to you. Yes, Rania. I love the idea of calling me a censor. Like, um, I like that. I like that idea that, like, I'm sort of like the shadowy censor who's deciding what speech can and cannot get through. <laughs> I, I'm not going to comment on the fact that you like that, but I do think that it is a good character role for you. Um, it is important to have <laughs> character in the show. Uh, this is almost like a... I don't even know, a Dostoevsky novel or something like that. Now, um, <laughs> hard pivot here, but Bobby, shout out. Thanks for the donation. Uh, we're going to go to New York City where I am, so I guess it's really not much of a hard pivot. We're just starting the show with our two home areas. We want to move to the mayoral race here in New York City. Obviously, the Democratic primary attracted quite a bit of attention, notably so. Of course, New York, the largest city in the United States. Eric Adams was the victor there. For many people, that means that the race is over, but the reality is the race is not over by any stretch of the imagination. Eric Adams is currently being challenged by Kathy Rojas, who is a socialist candidate with the Party for Socialism and Liberation in the mayoral race. And we are very honored to be joined here by Kathy Rojas. Kathy, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me and having me here. I appreciate it. No, the pleasure is all ours. So, I mean, I guess I'll just ask you the most obvious question first, Kathy. Why are you running for mayor of New York City? Um, well, I think as someone that lived through COVID-19 and one of the epicenters of the epicenters of COVID-19, I was living in Elmer's, Queens, a few blocks from Elmer's Hospital, um, where there were you know, trucks, refrigerated trucks parked outside just one or two blocks away from my house with the bodies of my neighbors, of my community, of the parents of my students, right? Um, and the reason that they were there wasn't so much so because of COVID-19 per se, but it was because of the neglect that this government had in our communities, right? The lack of aid for undocumented workers, the lack of access to adequate housing. We had eight, you know, in a lot of places, we had eight people living in one room. How mm. can people quarantine if they don't have adequate housing? For nine years, hospitals have been shutting down in Queens throughout the entire New York City so then the only public hospital that we had in the area was Elmer's Hospital. If you don't have insurance, most immigrants don't. It's an immigrant community. Where can you go? You can only go to Elmer's Hospital. They had more people than they were able to serve. Um, and therefore, that caused a lot of deaths in our community. So mm -hmm. I think that COVID-19 made it clear that for us, for New Yorkers, this race was life or death because you know, we had thousands and thousands of deaths in New York City, and they could have all been prevented if we would have put the interests of working class people in the forefront. And only a socialist uh, go a mayor can do that. 
Yeah. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and I maybe buried the lead a little bit there. You mentioned your students. You're also a public school teacher. I'm really glad that you brought up the issue of COVID-19 and the impact on New York because, I mean, you weren't just in the middle of it, but you were also working, I know, doing organizing and engaging with people. Talk about that a little bit because I think a lot of times people talk about experience in these mayoral races, and I think that's a really very significant bit of experience in terms of our current situation here in New York. Right. Well, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, my work as a teacher and, and, and as a community organizer, one of the things that happened was that we were seeing, I work in a school that's 100% immigrant. Um, many of my students and their families are undocumented. They couldn't qualify for any aid. Um, their families became sick with COVID-19 and they couldn't go outside. They didn't have any money. They had to pay rent, all of these things. So what did we do? We started with Centro Corona, shout out to Centro Corona. Uh, we started a weekly grocery delivery drive uh, where we were literally um, buying food in bulk base. And we use actually Cuba's rationing model on how many, like how many calories each person should receive based on how many family members they had. And then we basically uh, created boxes that we would deliver every single week to ensure that our families were fed. On top of that, we, you know, I was spending hours upon hours helping uh, families apply for grants, uh, for nonprofit grants, GoFundMe grants, um, things of the sort. And then there was just the regular part of teaching, right? That we didn't, students didn't have access to Wi-Fi. We had to be on the phone for hours. I'm talking about hours on hold with Spectrum just to get a student free Wi-Fi, right? When really the government could have just opened, you know, the broadband and, and given free Wi-Fi to everyone. But because Wi-Fi is privatized, we had to be uh, on the phone for hours. And these are all teachers doing this. Um, trying to get our students Wi-Fi. Um, in terms of, of rent, even during the eviction moratorium, I had to be on the phone with landlords explaining, you know, we are in a in a eviction moratorium. Uh, uh, eviction moratorium. You can't evict your tenants right now. Um, if they're small landlords, I explained to them, you know, the benefits that that they can have. Um, if they called their mortgage company and maybe had their mortgage stop for a few months, but it was really non-stop work uh, for our community. And uh, for me as an organizer in an immigrant community, all throughout 2020, I mean, it's only slowing down now. Um, you know, we have the fund excluded workers that just opened on August 1st, um, but, but is the eviction moratorium is already getting lifted and only 5% of rent relief has actually been dispersed. Mm. Uh, the excluded workers funds haven't been dispersed yet. So if you were undocumented and missed pay, um, you know, you don't have any aid and you can still be evicted. So, you know, we're still fighting every single day for the livelihood of our community. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, Kathy, so, no, go ahead, I'm- Rania. Well, teacher, I was I curious, you know, <laughs> it's, I was curious. Uh, it can't be easy to run in a place like New York City, which is obviously dominated by the big political parties. Um, one, I guess I would ask how receptive are people to the message? I imagine quite receptive because the kinds of things that a socialist would talk about are things that average people, you know, affect their their lives um, and would make them better. But also in terms of being able to get your message out, I mean, are you uh, not being a Republican or Democrat, going to be able to participate in, for example, a debate? Um, are you able to get the kinds of platforms like our mainstream outlets coming and asking you about what your platform is? Or is it a very difficult situation to try to get that attention? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so definitely in terms of our outreach and when we're out in the community talking to people, everybody's receptive. We are in working class communities. We are in communities that are facing eviction. Um, you know, so when we're talking about canceling the rents and mortgages, that's someone that's something that will benefit everyone. You know, housing has been an issue in New York City before the pandemic. It's going to be an issue after the pandemic. And we have long term solutions. We're looking at how to make New York City a rent control city where, um, you know, they can't be charged more than 20 percent of their income for rent or for housing, 
And when we look at right now, people, you know, there was a shooting in uh, Corona, Queens. Ten people were shot in one day. That was all over the news. The Republican candidate were saying we need to expand the gang database and the, the fault is on undocumented immigrants. Eric Adams is saying that we need to expand the NYPD. I teach in that community. Um, I, you know, I grew up around that community and I went out there to speak to people. They don't want more police. This is an immigrant community where, you know, any interaction with the police can lead to deportation, right? So I explained to them our plan for violence intervention programs, for mentoring youth, for creating classes on conflict resolution, for jobs, creating jobs for youth and for everyone in the community. And they expressed how much better of a plan that would be. Um, But these plans need to be funded. So when we're talking about uh, reallocating funds from the NYPD. We're talking about reallocating them to systems and structures that work in minimizing violence in our community, work in terms of, you know, supporting and empowering and transforming our communities as opposed to criminalizing them. So these are all, all of the points in our platform, including like fully funding the infrastructure of the MTA through taxing the rich. These are all things that will benefit New Yorkers. So all New Yorkers have been in support of our platform. Yes, it has been very, very hard to get the mainstream media to pay attention to our campaign. We are sending out press releases and statements on a daily basis. When we go to actions, it, you know, we're always uh, trying to get the press to interview us so that we could show our perspective. At the end of the day, that you know, this is a this is known to be a two-party system, supposedly democratic, right? And we're running <laughs> as a third party, right? Um, in terms of, in, in terms of the debate, uh, we need to have a I think it's a hundred and fifty thousand dollars of donations uh, in order to participate in the debate. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it's a donation threshold in order to participate. So unless we are rich or we pander to the rich, we can't really mm-hmm. participate because we're not making that level of donation. But that goes to show that they limit these elections so much so that they want anyone that truly has the interest of working class, class people and truly has an allegiance to working class people that they are kind of barred uh, as much as they can. Uh, that they're trying to borrow us as much as they can in the media and in debate so that nobody hears our perspective because they know that if people hear our perspective, they will be moved to fight and struggle for transformation and liberation in New York Mm. City. Mm. Well, I'm glad you raised this issue of, uh, you know, the rich and the impact that they play on New York. I mean, would you say that one of the biggest maybe defining factors of this race is that, of course, Eric Adams is getting all the support from Wall Street, is whether or not we're going to continue the, I think what many people would call business uh, business as usual here in the United States with the Wall Street companies and the real estate investors, or whether or not we're going to have some level of empowerment and voice for working class people. Yeah, definitely. Eric Adams has received $11 million in donations from real estate developers, from police unions, from all of the organizations that are known to oppress the very same working class people that he's supposedly going to represent. So I urge people, you know, track where the money's coming from. How is it so that he's saying he's going to create a better New York for working class people while he's taking money from the same people that oppress them? You know, it's impossible because that's going to be his allegiance to them once he takes office. And our role is to fight that at every level, right? To talk to people in the streets. We have people in all five boroughs doing outreach, speaking to community members, We are going to protest. We're talking to community um, organizations. We're speaking to progressive nonprofits about endorsements. And at every level, we are doing everything we can so that people see our platform, so that they know about our platform, and they know that a different reality is possible and realistic for New York as long as we fight for it. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who wins. What matters is whether or not New York City working class people can unite 
to fight for what they need to survive and to fight about against the capitalist class that will always put the interests of the rich instead of their lives first. Well, I think that's an important point that you raised there, and it brings me to, I think, what's been another big conversation about the city of New York City, but the state of New York, and that is, you know, in many ways, New York has become sort of the center of socialist politics in the United States, and there's a lot of exciting things, people talking about India Walton in Buffalo and other things like that. So, I mean, are you placing your race here in this broader context of not just the city, but also the state and the country and the need for a bigger and a broader change for working class people? Absolutely. I mean, we're just getting out of a 20-year war, right, that did nothing but destabilize Afghanistan, loot the resources of the country, kill 150,000 people in Afghanistan. It caused the death of, I believe it was 6,000 American soldiers, and it cost the country. And when I talk about the country, I'm talking about our money, our tax dollars. It cost our tax dollars $2.23 uh, trillion. Now, with that, we could have paid all the back due rent in, in, in the United States, we could have paid for student debt for, uh, for a bachelor's degree. We could have paid for health care, for housing, for all of the necessities that our people have, right? So, but yet, the United States on a local level and on a federal level always chooses to fund oppression, to fund militarization instead of protecting the social services that we need. So I think that throughout the United States, but really throughout the planet, our planet, our country will benefit from a socialist government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, one thing I just want to say for people who may be liking what you have to say, where can people find your campaign? Yes. So people could go on Rojas 4. So that's Rojas and then the number four, mayor.nyc. They come follow me on Instagram at Rojas4, number four, um, mayor. Or they could follow me on Twitter on Rojas4, mayor2021. Excellent. Well, Kathy Rojas, candidate for mayor in New York City from the Party for Socialism and Liberation, we really appreciate you coming on and telling us a little bit about your run. Thank you for having me. Excellent. No, happy to do it. And happy that to see that. got me fired up. Yeah, well, see, there it is. And, and I think that... Uh, <laughs> For those who think the mayoral race is over, perhaps you can see there's some strong energy coming from the socialist sector. I don't know if you actually saw this, Rania, but Eric Adams, the Democratic candidate, has now actually tried to turn himself into the poster child for the struggle oh. between capitalism and socialism. He said, I represent <laughs> the moderate Democrats, the base, da 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 da, da and I'm being targeted oh. by not the socialists of New York City, the socialist of America, and they're trying to take me down. Ooh. So he's making this into kind Eric. of his meme that he's against no, socialism. No, Eric, Eric, my dear, <laughs> no, no. Former cop too, so. Uh, I'll tell you something, I'll tell you something real quick before we segue please, into please, the next guest we please. have on. I wanna make a note, I, I'm, I, people who are watching noticed that uh, the lights went out for me mm -hmm. and then came back on. That was the state electricity going out and the generator turning on. And I just want to say something about being in Lebanon, and I'm going to connect it to the issue of socialism versus capitalism. Please. Is I feel like I'm, I'm, everyone keeps saying, oh, Lebanon is like going back into the Stone Age because of like this fuel crisis. We have no electricity. We have to like use candles and lanterns. I actually feel like Lebanon's an advanced country. Mm. And what I mean by that is it's kind of like a glimpse into the future of what happens when you let, capitalism decay everything mm. that is what's i'm like sitting in the epicenter of the results of that right now just complete neoliberal rot and decay and i feel like unless something drastic changes uh with our global capitalist system this is going to be the fate of a lot of areas of the world and i don't just mean the third world by the way i mean just watching the snowballing effect of when everything breaks down um, as I'm experiencing it. Uh, and so to Eric Adams, if people like him get to stay in charge, Lebanon's going to be all of our futures. Yeah. Well, I hope he hears that. Although I've also heard he's on a European vacation right now. <laughs> uh, I hope he has a safe trip back to his apartment in New Jersey when he gets back. Uh, <laughs> just, 
Google that. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, Rhonda. And, you know, I Eugene, think it's just true throw now. in some shade. Yeah, I, I had to throw a little, had to throw a little bit there. Yeah. But no, I think your point yeah. is very well taken about where we're going. You look at these wildfires sweeping the world and just everything. It's, whew, it's a lot. Well, mm-hmm. we want to go to our next topic with very, very important topic. Uh, unfortunately, I think it has been a bit overshadowed in the news because of what's been happening in Afghanistan. Not that that's not important, but we want to turn to the country of Haiti, which of course has been devastated by a recent earthquake, also lashed by a tropical storm in the past couple days, and of course the ongoing neoliberal disaster that is foisted on the people of Haiti. So we are very happy to be joined again here on the Freedom Side by Jamima Pierre, who is the America's coordinator at Black Alliance for Peace and also a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. Jamima, thank you so much for being back with us on the Freedom Side. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I want to just start maybe with what we know to the uh, the situation now, and a lot is emerging. What do we know about the scale of the devastation uh, from the recent natural disasters that have hit Haiti? Um, well, you know, the, uh, there are about more than 2,000 uh, uh, bodies have been found uh, dead. Um, at this point, about 10, 12,000 um, injured and about 300 or so missing. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really terrible. Um, it, uh, the only saving grace, if there is one, is that it didn't happen in a highly populated um, area um, in, in Haiti, like Port-au-Prince, like last time when we had you know, over 200,000 dead. So, so that's the scale of the devastation. And we have to know that, of course, tropical storm grace passed through a couple of days after that where people were already sleeping in the streets um the people who lost their homes but also the people who um were afraid to be in their houses because mm-hmm. there were and there were multiple aftershocks in fact yesterday there was an aftershock that was like you know the aftershocks are above 5.0 um and so there have been non-stop aftershocks in, uh, uh, along that area so so it's been it's been really devastating um what's heartening is also the fact that it's been Haitians helping Haitians because, you know, we have this failed, uh, I wouldn't call it failed state, but I, we have this non-existent state or a state that's captured mm-hmm. by the U.S. and the international community. And then, you know, the, I guess the U.S. military hasn't made its way there, even though we know that they're coming. Well, I'm really glad you raised that last point because, uh, I noticed that Dr. Ariel Henry, the prime minister, told the New York Times today that we have to come together. I'm bringing people together. You know, we're working with our international partners. And I I just thought, well, that obviously can't be the full story. I I mean, what is the status right now with this? I mean, there's also a political crisis, if you can call it that, that has been going on. I mean, are you, I I don't know, fearful is the word, but it, it seems as almost like this may be a moment where the this so-called government of Haiti tries to use this disaster to legitimize itself in some way and, and perhaps even bring in foreign intervention to, to back up their, their writ. Well, uh, that's exactly what's going to happen. I, I, I do think the first thing I said after the earthquake was that, you know, this is another opportunity for the, the, this illegitimate government, which was handpicked and put in power by the U.S. and the core group, uh, onto the, Haiti, this would be the opportunity for them to consolidate their power. It's also an opportunity for the international NGOs, the Haitian oligarchy, and the foreign imperialists to consolidate their power. Because if people want to remember, or people don't know, af- it was after the 2010 coup, um, I would say coup d'etat, but, but it was an <laughs> earthquake, that you had all these groups consolidate their power. And so you had, and I just wrote a piece about this in the Black Agenda Report, about how after, 2000, after the 2010 earthquake, the oligarchy, a lot of them, you know, a lot of the wealthy families who were land rich, some of them cash poor land rich, were able to make all kinds of money because they owned the ports, the lands, the hotels that the aid agencies needed. And then the aid, you know, uh, 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 industrial complex, <laughs> um, you know, made a killing off of Haiti. If we know what the Red Cross and the Clinton Foundation did in Haiti. And then what the U.S. did was basically, uh, if people don't know, we were already under U.N. occupation from 2004 after the U.S., Canada, France led um, coup d'etat against our democratically elected president, jean bertrand Aristide. So from 2004, by the 2010, the, we were still under occupation. Um, and then you have the earthquake and then you have cholera brought in by the occupation forces. And then the U.S. forces Haiti to have an election right a month after the cholera uh, epidemic breaks out. 
And this is where they installed Michel Martelly in the PHTK party, which would then bring in also install Moise. And so the 2010 earthquake was a really a perfect opportunity for them to completely dismantle the Haitian state and to completely take over um, the control of Haiti. And we see that and we already see, you know, this, the machinations in the making. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm glad you also raised that because I feel that one of the other sort of subtext that always comes out of this is, as this, this is almost just sort of divine providence, Haiti can't catch a break, so on and so forth. And obviously, you know, no one can prevent earthquakes, but it's the idea that somehow it's just these random forces as opposed to a true agenda for Haiti and what these the core group in these powerful countries want to use the nation for. You're absolutely right. Look, the crisis of Haiti is a crisis of imperialism. This is it. This is why a natural disaster like earthquake or hurricane become catastrophic. Because, you know, we get earthquakes. You know, I live in California. There are earthquakes. We get earthquakes. You know, there are hurricanes where I'm from Miami. You know, so there, you know, we get all of these. What makes these things catastrophic is the political situation. And in Haiti, it's the complete dismantling of the Haitian state, the neoliberal policies that the U.S. and the Western world is forcing on the Haitian population, the, 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 the stealing of Haitian resources by both the oligarchy and the international, quote unquote, international community, which we mean the, the West. Um, and these are the ones that, re, that allow, and then the, the, the NGOs, right, the people who work, you know, uh, to, to um, supposedly help Haiti. But what happened? You know, Haiti raised $13 billion after the 2010 earthquake. Well, Haiti is known as the Republic of NGOs. So how could they not, in the 10 years since the, 11 years since the last earthquake, build the infrastructure to allow this, to, to make sure this doesn't happen again? How does the uh, Red Cross get away with building six houses after raising half a billion dollars? So to me, is the problem is imperialism and we need to get rid of these foreigners from occupying our space and our politics and our and, and our society. It's such an important point about the aid agencies. I mean, where does this money go? Maybe that's a naive question, but you know, I had the opportunity to be in Haiti in March and I kept telling people that it was just this cognitive dissonance because I can always remember all the ads you see on TV, donate to Haiti, you know, aid for Haiti, we're helping Haiti, we're building hospitals, we're doing this, everyone's got a charity in the US helping Haiti, it seemed. And then you're there and you're just like, well, wait, is that, where is all of this money going? The money goes right back into the coffers of the US and the other governments that are giving aid. Let's be real. In fact, there's a report that came out, even the Guardian did a report that out of the, all the money that was doled out, 53% of them went back to companies in Washington, D.C., mm. right, 53 percent of that. Um, the rest of the world, you know, these NGOs got 40-something percent, and 0.7 percent of all that money went to actual Haitian institutions and Haitian businesses. And so that's what the, the money is going into, no-bid contracts, to the oligarchy and other companies that have, you know, friends like uh, <laughs> Bill Clinton, yeah. you know, who was doling, who was the king of Haiti, doling out reconstruction mm. aid. Um, you know, the, the money goes to that to so don't no big contracts. And so you can get a no big contract to provide electricity and you don't nobody's going to ask you where's the electricity after, you know, 15 million dollars later because the state has been destroyed. And so that's really what's happening. It's like, you know, what what Clinton did was build two luxury hotels and a, and a you know, free trade zone park, industrial park in the northern of Haiti that wasn't impacted by the by by the earthquake. And so. Part of that is we have to call out the, the, the state, but we have to call out the, you know, the, the desk pushers, the people who sit there and work for these little NGOs. They're not little, that get funding that, you know, for me, you know, as a professor, I, I always say that the, one of the biggest um, uh, majors at these universities are development studies, right? Mm. And, and, and the, 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 the ideological training of young, young Americans to think that they need to go help somebody else and, and so I think the development agency is a make work project for all these people with BA degrees who can't find work in the U.S. because that's, that's what it does. You know, when I was in Haiti in 2010, I would go, I went to this resort and that's what I talk about in this article, but they're just hanging out. You know, the aid workers, you know, you drive through Rubble, you get to this resort and they're just hanging out, playing volleyball, eating all this food. And that's what, that's where the money goes. It goes it's to support all of this, all of this leisure for the aid and, and military that, that is there supposedly to help. Mm. I mean, just the, the unbelievable crime. I, I don't know how else to really describe it. And you know, you, you already mentioned this and I, I wanted to speak to this because of course we have this NGO industrial complex, but also as you mentioned, Haitians helping Haitians. What are we seeing in terms of that kind of mutual aid on the ground? 
Well, that kind of aid was always on the ground, right? You know, immediately after the, the first earthquake, when we were there in 2010, like four days after the earthquake, we flew in and we drove through from the Dominican side. Because the other thing is the U.S. government, Hillary Clinton, had taken over Haiti's airspace. And because we have to also think about like the military response, and we can talk about that briefly, because what the U.S. does, you know, Cuba sends doctors, the U.S. sends the military, right? So this is what really <laughs> always happens. But when we came in four days after the earthquake, places that hadn't gotten aid, people were helping each other. People were living in the streets because they're afraid to go back into their houses. It's Haitians helping other Haitians, you know, along with the Cuban doctors that are there. But it's Haitians digging themselves out, helping people come out, carrying people to whatever clinic is around. That part of it always gets lost and becomes invisible because the aid project is about promoting themselves. And so what you're gonna see is the mainstream news talk about, oh, look, the military's there, you know, the Red Cross is there, USAID is there. And we forget in the, immediately after the earthquake, it's Haitians helping Haitians. Me, uh, I'm sorry, it makes me wonder, sorry, I was muted there. Uh, where does this leave the popular movement in Haiti? I mean, of course, that's the other subtext here is there's been this huge mass popular uprising in Haiti going on that uh, has, you know, in many ways shaken up the whole world for those of us who have been watching. I mean, obviously, it's a very difficult circumstance to do almost anything in, but where does it leave the political struggle at this moment? And, well, that's the thing, right? And I think we need to, you know, this is going to overshadow the fact that we have an illegitimate government that was installed by the U.S. on Haiti, right? It's going to overshadow the fact that since 2016, people have been in the streets fighting and demanding that we have a legitimate government. It's going to overshadow the fact that civil society has been meeting and coming up with alternative ways to rule Haiti that were completely bypassed by the U.S. and the core group. And so what we need to do is actually amplify the fact that there is a political situation that needs to be um, uh, corrected on the ground in Haiti, because if we don't correct this political situation, this aid, you know, what's going to come in is going to be a debacle and it's going to be worse in 2010 in terms of how Haitians, regular Haitians fare. Well, you know, the final thing I just want to ask, because I think this is a question that always people throw out is, is not only who they should be supporting if they can, but how they can support. And I think the point you're making too about the context of imperialism is a piece of that that often gets left out in that conversation. Yes. Well, the first thing people need to do is tell the U.S. and the core group to stop meddling in Haitian affairs. Um, they need to say that you can send aid without thousands of military troops. We need to stand against any potential for intervention. Uh, already this morning, you know, the, the, the U.S. Marines, you know, tweeted pictures of, you know, I forgot which infantry. It was um, the U.S. Marines with the 1st Battalion, 6th Marines, prepared to load gear to support um, to go to Haiti. So they're already, you know, they're already there because that's the way they think it's the military, right? So this idea of military assistance, especially with the, with what happened with the embarrassment of Afghanistan, the whole point is to actually show its strength in military. And so we need to fight to tell, you know, to stop any kind of military intervention. And, and the thing is, it's difficult. I, you know, be very careful who you donate to because right now, because everyone knows that there's a you know, every, you know, hey, nobody wants to deal with foreign hate, foreign aid, because they're all thieves, right? Like, that's what Haitians call them. That's especially the USAID, which is like soft power, um, not even soft power, but they're, imper they're the imperialist arm of, of the U.S. But you have to be careful because some people say, claim that they're local and they're not. So you have to look to see, look to see the organization, who's funding them. So if, they, if it says George Soros, I don't think you should be part of that. I think you should really, you know, I would suggest go to the Haiti Action committee, which has been doing work in Haiti for a long time, um, and, and they have a Haiti emergency relief fund that they've been, um, that they've been having for years. And I, that's the only organization that I actually trust at this point, because we can't trust most of these others. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's an extraordinarily important point. Jamima, I really appreciate you joining us again. I hope everyone goes to Black Agenda Report and checks out your recent article on the situation and Haiti. But thank you again for your time. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Well, Rania, I mean, obviously, uh, as our disaster capitalism, I mean, that's what we're, we're looking at mm -hmm. all over the world. Uh, I think the point you made about so Lebanon, much, what we're talking about Haiti. So much of what you just said, I'm just sitting here, like I was sitting here nodding along, like exactly, like yeah. the whole idea of an entire economy built around sur offering services to NGO workers, uh, for them to like live lavishly while the, the local population can't even afford to access those sorts of restaurants and resorts, it's exactly how Lebanon is, 100%.
there's a whole, and a lot of other countries. I mean, I spoke to someone recently on the on program dispatches about South Sudan, and he described how with the creation of South Sudan came the creation of this whole side of the economy that was built just for Western NGO workers. Right. Amazing. I mean, it's just like, it's, I mean. Ugh, no, I know. When you think about the role of the UN in so many of these places and every time, you know, mm -hmm. they're, oh, we're doing all this humanitarian stuff. Then you learn five years later, these rampant prostitution, all these other pieces mm -hmm. that come along with that, of uh, you know, criminal actions oftentimes in these so-called humanitarian pieces. Well, we're going to get to Afghanistan in a bigger way a little later on in the show. But while we, uh, <laughs> before we get to our next topic, Rania, you and I have been talking about the White House press corps, <laughs> some of the reactions they've been having, um, I don't know, vis-a-vis -vis the whole I mean, situation. What, there's, there's this guy recently, was it Tajikistan, <laughs> he was doing something regarding that? I just want to give a caveat. Like, Please. we, Afghanistan is a very dark issue right now. Yes. This is like the one comical aspect of it, is seeing the behavior of the White House press corps and watching these journalists freak out, not because of like the humanitarian crisis or obviously these horrible image that, images that we're seeing come out of like the airport in Kabul or the fear that many people rightfully have of the Taliban, all these issues that of course people should be concerned about. Not because of that, but freaking out because the US military is in one less place in the world. Um, and yeah, we do have this clip that just we have to, we have to show it. We have to show it. Can we put it up? Thank you, sir. President Biden said that there were very few national security interests for the United States in maintaining some peace in Afghanistan. Could, would you actually reiterate that today? Would you say that there is no interest for us having some presence on the borders of Iran, on the borders of Pakistan, on the borders of uh, uh, near China, would you, or Tajikistan, would you just say that, we're, that we should just give that up? I would say that the president does not believe that the United States should be fighting and dying in a war for the purpose of sustaining American military boots near Tajikistan or Pakistan or Iran. No, I would say that that is something uh, that is not could we, we, what you just laid out as a national security interest, we would not agree that it is right to ask American soldiers to risk their lives for the purpose of maintaining a presence near Tajikistan. Yes. I mean, like, the way that guy acted, you would think that his family was living on the border of Tajikistan, right. right? And that they were going to die unless they had the protection of American soldiers. Like that was his, that was the, the like, the like fear in his voice was like, are you just, you're just Tajikistan? You're just not going to be in Tajikistan? <laughs> like, I bet you this guy can't even point out Tajikistan on a map. I know, he, said, he goes, he goes like, near China. I, I mean, Tajikistan. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, I guess in an existential stage, Tajikistan is very near China, but it's just like, I mean, it, and also, what are you even talking about? I mean, he's like uh, near Iran, near China, near Pakistan, near Tajikistan. Well, I mean, one, I think it would be in those countries if you'd left Afghanistan, but two, he's basically saying, I mean, can you really say that you're not gonna have a colonial occupation in every single country in Central Asia? Could you really say you? you're not gonna do that? The horror. The heart. And you know what's funny to me is the fact that the voice of region, reason was Jake Sullivan, somebody right. who is one of the most hawkish advisors to Joe Biden and has always been. Like this guy was a backer of the Iraq war. He was a backer of the war on Syria. He supported the destruction of Libya, like and on and on and on. This guy is a huge hawk and he's like having to calm this reporter down. Like right, right. it's gonna like, be okay, really? yeah. dude. He really gave no, him a like, are you serious? <laughs> Uh, yeah. I mean, it really just, <laughs> who, I, I, I don't know if anyone even, I don't, I, I should have looked up who that guy was and who he was with. I actually don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Juan in the booth could do a little research for us there on that one. But I just, I'm just, what, who forms these, I mean, it just says everything you need to know. I mean, certainly about the White House press corps. I mean, the level of energy that they're bringing to this, I don't know if they ever bring this level of energy to any <laughs> significant, actually significant issue. Like when we're talking about rampant child poverty in the United States, I mean, you know, there are, I believe, 32 million workers in America that do not have access to one paid day off. Mm 
But if someone says, we're going to do something for paid days off, these people are more likely to say, how are you going to pay for it? Than say, don't you think that this is a global worldwide outrage that the richest country in the history of countries? But if you're not going to be in Tajikistan, then I mean, <laughs> like, what? I mean, just everything about it just is just, it's such a warped world that these people live in and that they're sort of contained in. And you can almost see it. Oh, here's Juan in the booth. I don't, I don't have the name. Can somebody think uh, about the Tajikins? <laughs> Tajikis? Tajikis? Tajikistanians? I feel no, bad now. We're like butchering the Tajikis. Um, the okay. In many ways, listen, beautiful country, beautiful part of the world, Central Asia. I'm not trying Wait. to hate on Tajikistan. Although, by the way, just in case people are concerned about Tajikistan, that's, so that's our weird. creative director <laughs> is concerned. Uh, Who Tajikistan happens, happens is to be pretty British. Well he happens to be British. He happens he to be British. British, which is why he's concerned. Because he, no, no, I'm saying that's why he's concerned. Well, because they also he's, he's um, had a failed colonial they occupation. They like to be everywhere. Yeah, yeah, little, he, yeah, he feels it. Well, Tajikistan yeah. is well Anyways, armed. Tajikistan, Russia, and Uzbekistan actually just did a like a military drill drill about this issue. And I don't know. It, all I know is it involves something called a wall of fire. So I, I don't think that there's any need for this reporter <laughs> to be concerned about what's going on in Tajikistan. But it really, again, the fact that he says, he says near, like it's supposed to be about Afghanistan. And he said that the US presence should be near Pakistan, China, Tajikistan, and Iran. So it really just is almost like the subconscious colonialism of these oh, journalists. Yeah. I mean, this is not a new fact. I know we've talked about this a lot, Rania. A lot of people talk about this, about how formed these journalists really are by this pro-imperialist national consciousness. I mean, Nicole Wallace, who of course was on the other side of that once, right? She was a spokesperson for George W. Bush. She actually right. said this after Biden's speech on Afghanistan about pulling out of Afghanistan. She said 95% of Americans will agree. 95% of the White House media that's covering this will disagree. And I thought that was a really <laughs> honest comment. Like we are all for war occupation forever, even though no one in America is. Well, it's also a good, like, good to note that uh, you mentioned how these people. This is why they work for the White House press corps. This is in the White House press corps. This is why they have jobs at mainstream outlets. Like, the, there's a reason that 95 percent of them are horrified about the idea of the U.S. not being in a country anymore. It's because there is this like to get a job in corporate media, to get a job at these mainstream outlets, you have to be pro-war. And if you're not, you better shut up about it or you'll get fired like Chris Hedges yep. or like who was the guy that was like the NBC guy who got fired because he opposed the war in Iraq. Like you don't get to climb that ladder unless you are a hardcore imperialist or you're willing to push those talking points. And it kind of works in a way. We pretend we have this democracy with this free press, but it works to uh, pressure any president or official who wants to uh, lessen America's presence for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's like a check on that system. It's a check to make sure that we stay at war all the time, that the military industrial complex continues to profit um, and to continues to like be this racket that it is. Uh, in this case, of course, leaving prevailed. Uh, but we can, we'll talk more about later about, you know, the issues of the way we left. Yeah. But yeah. That's Ronnie, why we, we work have for Breakthrough a, a News. Super chat here. And not. Is that is this oh, allowed? It looks like Can it. we? Is it cleared? Oh, we do. We have one. We have one from earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have Southern Comrade. I like that name. Um, Southern Comrade from earlier said solidarity with and much love for Kathy Rojas in New York City, the resilient people of Haiti and oppressed peoples of the global South. Love you guys. Right on. Thank you, Southern Comrade. I agree. Um, and no. again, to those who yeah. are watching, if you want to support Breakthrough News, you can either throw money in the super chat right now as we're talking live and I will decide if your comment is sufficient to read on air. <laughs> or if you'd like to do something longer term, you can go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash breakthrough news and become a patron and to help support our ongoing uh, journalism. We have a lot of things, exciting things coming up uh, in yeah. coming months. No, I, I think that's such an important point on certainly giving money, but also that you were making earlier about you know <laughs> needing to needing to be pro uh, pro war to get these. I mean, you think about Brian Williams who lied about being in a war zone, and you just even think about the number of just like pro war neocons 
who every intervention they've ever championed over the past 20 years has been massively destructive for the world. But the pages, of the op-ed pages of the country have been opened up to them like never before um, in terms of, of spewing their neocon ridiculousness. And I just thought to myself, and, and listen, I hate, I'm not trying to be one of these, oh, hey, I was against it from the beginning kind of people to pat myself on the back, but just to say that I was against it at the beginning, uh, 2002, <laughs> you know, I remember being out there protesting, <laughs> but it was nothing even remotely similar in terms of anti-war voices. I mean, huge numbers of people were against the war in Afghanistan and sub subsequently Iraq, and it was, you know, you, there was almost nothing. I mean, I'm not gonna say there was nothing, nothing, and, you know, some person will come behind and say someone wrote two things. But it certainly wasn't like this week where every person who supported the war in Afghanistan is like coming back 20 years later to be like, we could have won, they should have stuck around. And I'm just thinking the, the cacophony of pro-war voices compared to any sort of, and it's not just Afghan, I mean, this, we're talking about Syria, we're talking about Iraq, mm -hmm. we're talking about Libya. I mean, there's just never, we could talk about Haiti, which we just talked about in the occupation there. You it's never get country. any significant number of people in these major newspapers, but the way it opens up to these neocons who, again, have such a failed record. Like, it'd be one thing if, you know, you've been right on some things in the past. But you think if they're sitting around right. in the editorial meeting in the New York Times, they say, well, who are we gonna let in here? Are we gonna get someone who was wrong about every major foreign policy issue? I mean, maybe, I don't know, wrong, I don't know how you put that, morally wrong in that sense. We're gonna bring them in? I just, well, Juan, what do you think? No, it makes me, Behind it makes the me glass. think of a, when we were in Haiti. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we, like, we were in Haiti and there's, there's, there's massive protests in the street, like thousands of people in the street and the New York Times um, puts out an article titled, titled uh, um, Sorry about that, I'm thirsty. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take a sip of water <laughs> But basically, like, Sneak titled, like, Go at it, President Jovenel Moise goes, uh, tries to turn, turn around the country with some criticism, even though there's, like, literally 100,000 people, if not more, out in the street protesting. And it has been going on for months. For actually over a year have been going on. And we were out we we're out in the middle of the street when this article came out. And who do they interview in the article? Haitians on the ground? His people criticizing him? No, Jovenel Moise himself. Yeah. He's the one Haitian <laughs> in Haiti that they, they interviewed, Jovenel Moise. Yeah. And they weren't at that demonstration. No, with they hundreds were not. of thousands of people. I mean, the only other, you know. Mainstream media I saw there was Al Jazeera, but the, all these other people were just nowhere to be found. But you see, as soon as <laughs> Moise was assassinated, they all rushed to get down yeah. there and act like they've been covering Haiti. The New York Times got a live blog on Haiti. Well, where was the live blog on Haiti when hundreds of thousands of people were trying to overthrow Moise? Or it's like when they do, whenever they do articles on anything related to the Middle East or even Afghanistan, for that matter, the people that you see quoted are always these people at think tanks that are funded by Lockheed Martin and Raytheon yeah. and like the State Department or in the case of anything having to do with any country in the Middle East that board like that borders Israel. They're like interviewing Israelis <laughs> constantly about what, well, you know, what do you think about Palestinians and Lebanese former and head of the Mossad. war in Syria? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, former head of Mossad, right? Exactly. Like, go ahead. I mean, it, it, I mean, in in Palestine, like weeks before, weeks before there was uh, like the bomb, like the bombs were being dropped by Israel. There was no coverage of Sheikh Sharar. Like, there was no coverage of mm -hmm. like the the right wing Israelis like taking over the mosque. Like, there was no mainstream coverage. And then when there is coverage, it's like, oh, there's here's some bo there's some mysterious. But like, oh, once again, they're bombing. Look, this, viol this violence coming from Palestine. Why did they start? Oh, Israel is only retaliating, which is like <laughs> such BS. But but it, it it fits a narrative. They're they're yeah. quiet when it doesn't when it doesn't like fit a narrative. And there's there's really the reality at the end of the day is that there's there's no like mainstream free press. They they end up being very much the fourth branch of the government. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot to be said about all of this. You know, we're, we'll certainly swing back around and talk more about this later on. We've got Mike Preisner coming up later. We'll talk much more about Afghanistan and, you know, perhaps near environs, because of course Afghanistan deeply connected, you know, to the broader imperial agenda of the United States and certainly mm -hmm. the ripple effects as well. 
We're going to turn back to the U.S. here, to Atlanta, the city of Atlanta, where there's been, well, and maybe there always is, quite a bit going on concerning policing and just generally brutality, racism, all of that here. Very happy to be joined as we continue the show by Kamal Franklin, who's an organizer with Community Movement Builders, and Monica Johnson, an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Monica, Kamal, thank you so much for being with us. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me too. No, of course, the pleasure is all ours. Well, you know, Kamal, I wanted to start with this issue of this police academy or whatever they're calling it, uh, that they want to build a massive police academy here in Atlanta. I mean, I know there's a number of, of issues. There's sort of technically what's happening with it and where it is in the city council. But I think there's also just the context of it. I think a lot of people think, you know, Atlanta, this is supposed to be the black Mecca, you know, it's, it's, which I think they would think it's, you know, it's progressive, so on and so forth. And to see, you know, right in line with the militarized policing playbook, might surprise some people, maybe it shouldn't, but talk to us about this 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 police academy and what's going on there. Sure, I mean, and for those who uh, are not familiar with Atlanta, yeah, as you said, it's considered, it's called the Black Mecca. There's been black mayors in Atlanta for the last 40 or 50 years, black run city councils for that uh, time period also. Uh, and supposedly the narrative is that this is a city too busy to hate. But really, it's a city too busy to care about its working class and poor black populations and has spent the last 40 or 50 years pushing those populations out of Atlanta and supporting corporate development, uh, real estate development. And at the behest of those forces have been the police who have been the front arm of folks who have been uh, overly policing, uh, arresting, harassing and in some cases, outright murdering black people. Um, and so that is a context which is really important to understand that Atlanta is much closer to a San Francisco and or a Seattle in terms of what it's trying to accomplish and what kind of city it's trying to make itself. And this cop city, this training center fits into that. So one, really quickly, this training center was something that the city council was trying to push through without any public commentary uh, any town hall meetings, anything that the public could be responsive to and talk about. Two, it's deforesting a larger, a large population of uh, a, a large area that is owned by the city of Atlanta, but Atlanta has promised to not deforest, but yeah, it's going to uh, go after and chop down over 100 acres of forest area. Three, um, this training center is fitting into a narrative that mainstream politicians are trying to push forward that somehow a training center that's going to take three to five years to build, even at its best um, time frame, has got anything to do with public safety now. So we think this is, you guys were talking about narrative a little earlier, we think this is really a political narrative attempt shifting in which the police are now going to be considered um, our heroes and saviors, as opposed to the people who've been criminalized, who've been jailing us, imprisoning us, uh, arresting us in untold numbers and getting away for, with it for decades. Well, you know, I think that's a, a, a great segue into the, you know, an issue you brought to my attention, Monica, and that's justice for DeAndre Phillips, who was killed by the police there in Atlanta. And, and I hope you could talk about what's going on with that case, because I think it speaks very directly to this issue of, uh, you know, police, friend or foe, I guess you might say. Right. So, you know, it's a um, not too surprising story and that, um, you know, DeAndre Phillips was killed in uh, 2017. Uh, the CCTV camera um, of it, uh, which is on, um, you know, various mainstream outlets. But the main problem um, his mother was, you know, expressing to me is that, you know, as of um, this week or last week, um, my weeks are blending together, um, the DA decided to close the case. Um, they concluded that uh, DeAndre was reaching for his gun, which of course we've heard many times before. Uh, therefore, um, you know, the cop, um, his name was, uh, I forget his name. Um, the cop was, uh, you know, in acting in self-defense, even though, uh, you know, the video does show him walking calmly, you know, as he shot uh, DeAndre point blank, you know, at that time. So, um, a long, it's a, it fits in with the long, um, you know, history of, um, 
of poli victims of police violence not getting justice. It also, you know, uh, with this narrative of, um, you know, the, the police are this, uh, this, the people that are served, um, sort of, uh, as the DI, uh, Fox, who poured on before in Liberation News, um, in Atlanta is, um, you know, just cate categorically declining to, um, prosecute any of these killer cops. So, yeah, well, uh, you know, the, 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 well, Monica, we're having a little problems with your connection here. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see if we can if we can fix that and we can get that back for you there and 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 bring that together. So we're gonna we're gonna look to that. So yeah, sorry if you can hear us. We're just having a couple technical issues, but we will we will get on that. But you know, I think it does raise an important point and a connected point, Kamal. I mean, this issue of you know people having a gun. I mean, this is always this. You know, okay, well, the XYZ person had a gun, so whatever we did, whether we killed him, punched him in the face, abused him, whatever it may be, it was all completely justified because these people are part of some, you know, deeper criminal class that must be militarily suppressed. Yeah, that, you know, if we go back even to the Rashad Brooks case of uh, uh, over a year ago that kicked off massive resistance and protests here in Atlanta, recently the police have tried to tie Rashad Brooks to a criminal gang as if that had anything to do with why that he was um, taken out of his car at the Wendy's, basically harangued, as opposed to calling a family member, letting him sit it out, calling a, uh, an ambulance to take him if he was intoxicated. Instead, the police decided to do a 40-minute interrogation and decide ultimately to try to arrest him. Um, and he got scared and, and, and ran away. And then they shot him in the back. So everything begins to get justified by the police act of people who are supposedly, you know, even with this, this training center, right, supposedly trained, uh, supposedly uh, uh, know how to handle conflict. But really what they're trained on is how to abuse people in our community. Their training specifically is around how to take control of any situation and exert their authority. And that includes shutting people down. So whether a gun or no gun, there's recently been videos across the country about people person in an ambulance who uh, was already strapped down and said something, the cop leaped over just to punch this person in the face. There was a story here in Southwest Atlanta about a woman who was handcuffed, laying on the ground, and she was having a potentially a psychotic episode, and she spit on the officer's shoe. The officer decided to kick her in the face, not once, but twice, kicked her so hard she rolled down a hill. So these incidents are continual, and as opposed to thinking about the role of the police in our community, they want to reward the police with this new narrative and give them a multi-million dollar training center. I mean, and I'm, I'm glad you've made these connections too, especially between the nature of gentrification and the role of policing. I mean, this something that, you know, for community movement builders was an issue recently. For people who don't know, you have a beautiful mural on the side of the community movement builders house. And I mean, you know, they've uh, I don't know, I think they've backed off on it now, but I mean, talk about that a little bit because I think it shows the, the level of sort of police enforcement of this agenda. Yeah, I mean, we've had this mural on our wall for over two and a half years. It's a, it's a home that's owned by the organization uh, and only recently, and we should also mention that the chief sponsor of the training center is Joyce Center. Uh, Joyce, mm. um, uh, uh, oh, her last name is now escaping me. She is the city councilwoman for that area. And uh, we also are in that area. And so she's been constantly, we've been at odds. And so we mm. think part of the targeting of our mural um, was her in particular uh, telling city forces to go after us. So we think that's part and parcel of what's happening. Uh, you know, we were uh, really involved in the Rayshard Brooks protests last year, which again was in her district, which she refused to come out against the police. Uh, she tried to make excuses for the police when that happened. Joyce Shepard is her name. I'm sorry about that earlier. Um, so that city councilwoman, we think, um, is really a pro-police, um, anti-reform, anti-defund, anti-anything to do with making sure that the police are checked. Um, and we think she had something to do with the fact that the city came after us. And yes, only because we put out the, the criminal summons we received on social media and got such a great response that the city itself decided to back off and basically squash the uh, the ticket. 
Mm -hmm. Monica, I think we have you back here now. I mean, I'd like your thoughts on a similar question, which is, you know, this, this, you know, so-called black political class, and I think that's often held up as a form of empowerment, but, you know, it's not just about sort of your identity, but it's about your agenda. Um, you know, Joyce Shepard, various other city council people have been, um, you know, kind of putting themselves up as a symbol of uh, progress or whatever else. I, I watched some news clips around her comments on Cop City, and, you know, she's saying she wants to protect the community. She's saying, you know, all these things. But um, I, I found the officer's name, um, Abdullah Hub. And he also has another case of, some, of um, having beaten someone, you know, very badly in Atlanta. Um, so that was reported in the wake of uh, the Andre Phillips family trying to get justice. So, you know, we have this cop that has this history of violence, um, you know, who is not being prosecuted. We have, um, you know, this idea that there is, um, you know, this, this, this mass of scary, uh, you know, criminals that are trying to victimize um, Black Atlantans would really most often is the police and other, other um, you know, aspects of the state, whether that be, um, uh, you know, the poverty, the lack of um, disbursement of, you know, COVID-related housing funds, any of those things are, you know, sharpening contradictions and making, um, you know, conditions worse for people. And um, we have this narrative of, um, you know, Cop City um, leaving these these killers on the force that, you know, are known in the city for having killed people um, is, is apparently the right thing to do. And there's, you know, many other cases. Of course, Keisha Lance Bottoms, the mayor, is not seeking re-election. And um, in 2018, she claimed that she was going to close the Atlanta City Detention Center, and it's still mm. open. So uh, what we have is a lot of, you know, lies, um, you know, kind of overtures toward, uh, you know, what, what might be important to the Black community. And we're not um, getting the results in that way. No, I think that's an important point. And I think that, you know, in many ways, it's indicative of the moment that we really are in. And I mean, I think you pointed this out in the article you mentioned, Monica, on Liberation News about DeAndre Phillips, about how the district attorney herself had, you know, tried to essentially maybe make it easier on the, the cop who had murdered Rayshard Brooks. I mean, so you have the same old stuff that we, you know, see and have often complained about with various white DAs in terms of shopping cases and things like that. I mean, it really does speak that the mentality really does seem very similar in the nature of the prosecutor's office there in uh, the city of Atlanta. Yeah, for sure. And um, uh, Tyvana Phillips, DeAndre's mother, um, I spoke to her on the phone to do the um, to do the article, and she was talking about how prior to Fannie Willis getting um, inaugurated as the new DA, um, you know, she had done a a Zoom meeting with like five families of uh, police brutality victims in Atlanta, and um, you know, apparently some overture, and um, actually did not know anything about the stories of. Uh, any of those families. So, you know, got on Zoom to say, you know, here, I'm your DA, I'm here for you, supposedly. But her demeanor wasn't, um, wasn't warm, nor did she even put in the time to, um, to, to find out the story. So, of course, you know, it's not one woman, but it seems to be part and parcel of the Atlanta uh, political and criminal justice system. You know, we already talked about, or in other articles, we had to talk about how with the Rayshard Brooks case, Bonnie Willis tried to put it off to um, a different um, jurisdiction here in Atlanta. And, um, you know, when that failed, uh, you know, she did what she normally did and just declined to, uh, declined to charge. But, um, you know, Paul Howard, the one, the outgoing DA, um, you know, was being kind of um, vilified for starting to prosecute these people. That was part of why he was pushed out is for prosecuting Garrett Ross. Um, and so it seems that the political machinery of Atlanta, of course, is really very much in the, in the hand of big business and the police. Um, you know, to try to, um, I guess, beautify Atlanta and make it more palatable for business interests, like Kanal mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm glad you brought up the issue of the DA trying to have these, you know, these cosmetic meetings because, Kamal, you already mentioned the lack of community engagement on the cop city. And I saw that uh, Councilwoman uh, Shepard said, oh, no, we did have all this community engagement. And I feel like that's always a good subtext to talk about with these things, Kamal, is this idea of like what they consider to be community engagement. It's like, well, if we had one meeting, if we talked to one person, if we, you know, did whatever, like that's what it is. And it, it, in and of itself, to me, it seems to reflect the level of disrespect they have, you know, really for their own constituents. 
Yeah, a level of disrespect and disregard. I mean, they had their community meeting where uh, there was no public comment allowed. The only comments went straight to the moderator, who did, mm. then made the decision about what they would read and what they would not read. The first public comments uh, was the town hall that the coalition had uh, about two weeks ago now, which was the first time the public actually got a chance to speak about Cop City and what their thoughts were about it. And person after person spoke about the deforestation. They spoke about police tactics and antics. They spoke about why we're not focusing in on other areas of how to ensure public safety. And they spoke about why can't we use resources from the police, which is usually the most heavily funded agency of any city or county, towards alternatives to policing and alternatives to calling the police when it's not a police situation. And so instead of any of those things being on the city's agenda, the only thing that's there apparently is to push through a cop city with, again, no public input, no public comment, because large corporations have donated uh, not only to, obviously to portions of people's campaigns, but to the police foundation. And that's how the police foundation is looking to pay for this. So this is all part of their plan, as we talked about earlier, to support corporate development, corporate acts, but what rich people want and to disregard what happens, who are who has to take the brunt of this, which is poor people and working class people. And in Atlanta specifically, that means black people. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I really appreciate that very succinct on so many levels. And I appreciate the fact that there is resistance and organizing also going on against this attempt to just do a total neoliberal capitalist makeover there in Atlanta. Kamal Franklin from Community Movement Builders, Monica Johnson from the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Really appreciate both of, uh, both of you giving us some of your time from Atlanta here on the Freedom Side. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Of course, pleasure is always ours. And yeah, Rania, you know, I mean, it's unfortunately, this is a story that we could tell about so many cities all across the United States. You know, the rampant gentrification, the use of the police as essentially an army to back it up, to push it forward, to harass people, the, the murders, the I mean, it really is it just so it, just to connect it to some of the conversations we've been having. I mean, this whole idea of the U.S. as a beacon for freedom and democracy, I mean, it's <laughs> such a, a mockery. Yeah, it's 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 just it's a joke. It's such a joke. I mean, you have police forces. You know, we talk about other countries being authoritarian with police right. states. Look what we're talking about here. We have a police state in America. For whatever reason, we don't call it that because we're like allowed to say whatever we want on the internet. I guess I don't know. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> quite sure. What it it's true. Stops as much as I'm laughing, it's true. Calling it what it is. It yeah. is. It's like yeah, I can sit here and say every bad word I want about the president on the internet. No one's gonna hopefully knock on my door and like take me to jail. But there's also like a serious threat in America for particular people. Uh, from a completely out of control police forces across the country and people live in terror of the police. I mean, yeah. what else do you call that? No, and it's how can you not? I mean, they have these guns, they can kill you, and there's no shortage of, of situations where you see nothing happens. I'm just reminded, like, because this is a good segue into the person we're about to have on next, but there was a headline in Politico yeah. uh, uh, yesterday, and I'm going to read the headline to you. Please. It's The headline is, can the U.S. make the Taliban care about human rights? Wow. <laughs> now, my first, my first thought about that was like, can somebody make the U.S. care about <laughs> right. human rights first? Like, and then, of course, my next thought was, well, did the government that the U.S. spent the last 20 years backing in Afghanistan, that was a bunch of corrupt warlords. Did the U.S. teach them how to care about human rights? It's a good Did the question. U.S. itself, its own occupation, know how to care about human rights in Afghanistan when they were shooting Afghan civilians and dropping the mother of all bombs on them and, you know, on and on and on drone yeah. striking them and their weddings and their funerals. I mean, what a joke. What you know, an absolute joke. You know, for some reason, joke. what you're saying, because I agree with you, it is such a joke. For some reason, it's reminding me of Right after the most recent war in Gaza, you know, where they've just destroyed the place, they've killed dozens of children, Ted Cruz, and also like the governor of Indiana, uh, go to Israel, and they're doing these videos of like, the, you know, the one house that was hit by a Katusha rocket, and Ted Cruz especially is like, look at this. 
these Palestinian terrorists <laughs> have destroyed this thing and da 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 And I'm just like, what world are you living in? Like literally probably 20 minutes from where you are right now, dozens of children's dead, hundreds of people killed, the whole place totally leveled, people don't have clean water, COVID running rampant. And here you right. are just in this 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 building. I mean, it was it's like so out there. But the fact that that's, that was not like widely panned and ridiculed. We talk about our yeah. White House correspondent guy, Tajikistan guy. I mean, where's the energy that he brought to Tajikistan to, like, one of the most prominent senators in the United States just making an absolute mockery about the idea of war crimes and human rights in any way? It's, it's, it's a shame. I mean, it's far more likely that that White House reporter would be asking would be asking about the like the the hole the little the little tiny like hole that the the rocket yeah. left <laughs> in the empty in the empty field. Be like, yeah. how do you why do you answer to this? Yeah. It's horrifying. Well, we do have a super <laughs> chat. I don't know if you approved it, Rania, but Arkala R, shout out to you. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think I you tried to say something about it. Stockholm Syndrome earlier. You'd said Berlin Syndrome. You wanted to correct yourself. I appreciate that. I appreciate you coming back into the chat to make sure that you were correct. We are all about <laughs> the facts here at Breakthrough News. But and oh, all of, we're all about correcting ourselves, too. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> we are I'm all about that. correcting ourselves. <laughs> well, we will segue here to the overall issue that we have been alluding to. It's obviously the biggest issue, at least in U.S. media, but I think around the world. That is all things Afghanistan. Very happy to be joined on the show now by Mike Preisner, who's a producer for The Empire Files. Mike, thank you so much for being with us. Happy to be here, y'all. Very happy to have you. You know, first, I actually want to get your thoughts on something we talked about a little bit earlier, which is the role of the media and the aftermath of the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan. I mean, it just, I mean, there's a couple different elements to it. I mean, one, there's just the element of the amount of pro-war voices that have emerged. You know, two, there's the element of, I saw the Washington Post in their editorial basically said we should continue occupying them forever. Um, and just this sort of, even people who don't go that far, just sort of, I hate to call it soft, but, you know, sort of pro-war-ish propaganda, even if they're not necessarily going as far as the Post did. I mean, the ability of the media to push this out, it honestly reminded me of right before the war in Afghanistan, more than anything else, just this flood of propaganda that seems in many ways untethered from reality, Mike. Yeah, well, I mean, first off, the Afghanistan war was like largely ignored by the mass media for most of the duration of the war. Of course, there was different peaks where all of a sudden they'd be covering it again for certain events like the troop surge, the end of the surge and so forth, the dropping of the Moab. But for the most part, it stayed out of the headlines because, you know, not enough soldiers were dying. It didn't matter that a lot of Afghans mm -hmm. were dying, but not enough soldiers were dying to justify it getting any kind of media coverage like the Iraq war did during the worst years of the Iraq war. But, you know, it was kind of a, an illuminating experience the past week of media coverage, because I think most people, um, including myself, you know, often think of the mass media as really stenographers for the Pentagon. You know, whatever the Pentagon generals are putting out, whatever the foreign policy establishment is putting out, that's regurgitated by the mass media. But that didn't exactly happen over the past week because the Afghanistan withdrawal is the Pentagon's plan. It's what the Pentagon wanted, it's what the Pentagon planned for, what the Pentagon negotiated, and what the Pentagon itself executed on the ground. So I don't understand the mass media, the corporate media, as uh, just cheerleaders for the Pentagon. They're really just cheerleaders for war. Um, because when the Pentagon decided to wrap up one of its lost wars, it got more backlash than I've ever seen a Pentagon plan get from the media for end, for ending a war and drawing it to a close. So, uh, of course, there's an easy explanation for that, being that the, the media is kind of the mouthpiece, not so much for the state, but for the interests of the ruling class and specific cent uh, sectors of the ruling class. One of those most powerful sectors, of course, is the defense industry and the energy industry. You know, people that, uh, that lost out uh, a, a bit with the Afghanistan war ending. There's not a constant, endless flow of mine resistant vehicles and missiles and so forth that were just being dumped on Afghanistan year after year. Um, and so there's probably some uh, nervousness from those who need to make more quarterly profits this quarter than the last quarter in the defense industry and in the energy industry that now have a kind of source of endless spending dried up and are um, 
you know, wanting to put this pressure on the White House and on the Pentagon so that they get guarantees that, well, you know what, there's going to be bigger contracts because we're going to be needing to drop bombs somewhere else or mm -hmm. building more vehicles to place in some other country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't worry, guys. Don't worry. We got the Cold War with China. There's plenty of contact with contracts coming well, your way. I, you know, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, no, I mean, even in Biden's speech where he had to go up and defend the withdrawal, you know, and his like when he was under a lot of fire because, you know, he obviously completely botched the withdrawal operation. I mean, that was just an absolute catastrophe and horror to see human beings falling from the C-17s that were leaving. I mean, that was obviously a huge screw up by the, the military op, the U.S. officers there and by the White House to allow that just kind of just dehumanizing chaos to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but in, when Biden had to you know, go and kind of cover up for the, the debacle um, and reinforce the fact that they truly were going to be leaving Afghanistan, um, he had to say, but this is because we have other battles to fight. He said Somalia, he said Yemen, <laughs> he said Syria, he alluded to China. And so, I mean, it was almost like saying to them, like, no, 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 we need to focus on war elsewhere rather than the war. So even in his speech about ending a war and holding strong to ending a war, he had to make these assurances that we were still committed to war elsewhere. I mean, who is that for? Seems, I mean, do the average Americans yeah, really care? Like, oh, no, we're not going to be at war. <laughs> it seems to me with Afghanistan that, you know, like you were mentioning, the war in Afghanistan was just this massive racket, right, where all of these contracts were being handed out. Lots of money was made by America's local partners who they kind of like put in charge of carrying out their mission at certain points, as well as American contractors. Um, and I think it came to the point where, you know, the people that were making the money versus the actual like U.S. empire were clashing because the U.S. empire had no geostrategic reason to be in Afghanistan anymore. But to that, to that end, I want to go back here and you know, I think it's important because this has been missing from all of the coverage of Afghanistan in the mainstream media, of course, which is like, we pretend it started in 2001, but Afghanistan did not start in 2001. I mean, that's when we think of it because that's when the U.S. invaded and occupied. But the reason it invaded and occupied was what, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban. Why aren't we ever talking about where these groups came from? And so I'd like for you to give a brief overview, Mike, because you've done this before and you've done it well, of that history of the 1979, which is when the U.S. actually started to destroy Afghanistan, and why and how did the Taliban and al-Qaeda come out of that? Yeah, well, I think Afghanistan today, uh, in particular by the media that uh, wants to paint the United States as saviors uh, to, to bring about human rights, women's rights, progress in Afghanistan, which you know, 20 years as an occupying force have zero examples of actually doing that. Um, it, it, it makes it seem as though uh, Afghanistan has never had that in their history and in, among their population. When, you know, um, mass movements for women's rights, uh, for socialism, um, for equality and for labor rights and all of these things were strong and vibrant. I mean, very much a part of Afghanistan's uh, fabric. Um, and not just that, but contributions to art and culture, literature, poetry, things like that. I mean, it's such a, a vibrant and important contribution to, to world culture. Um, and politics, left-wing politics and progressive politics were very much a part of that and advancing. And, and it was specifically that, that the United States first intervened in Afghanistan to destroy. Um, and of course, to create a state of war, to create a state of civil war, to provoke uh, the Soviet Union to invading, to create, you know, the Soviet Vietnam intentionally to uh, plunge the country into a state of endless war, precisely to just kind of meet the foreign policy, like the, the hegemonic goals of U.S. imperialism. And so, um, of course, that, you know, led, you know, that long you know, period of war set the stage for the situation that the U.S. said they had to intervene in. I mean, it's, uh, of course, a lot of history there, but I think that in whenever we hear this rhetoric of, you know, we need to go help people because women's rights are bad, I mean, we're seeing it so much with Afghanistan. It's always talked about in like a complete historical vacuum. They only want you to look at this one place and say, if only the U.S. was able to intervene or exert its values, as they call it, in this place, <laughs> Uh, we can establish a, a progress. We can establish human rights and women's rights. But there's 
a lot of example. Has, is there actually any example of the U.S. ever doing that anywhere with a military huh. intervention or a no. coup or any intervention? I mean, there is a lots of examples of U.S. military interventions. In fact, there are dozens and dozens just um, since World War II that you could point to. And what is the experience of all of those U.S. military interventions? Well, in all of them, human rights get set back. Women's rights get set back. Yeah. I mean, it's a catastrophe. I mean, even you don't even have to look in the distant history of decades ago, but just look at the Iraq war. I mean, the status of women in Iraq prior to the US invasion was very good. Um, and then now mm -hmm. it has been set back really generations precisely because of the US invasion and occupation. And so to kind of have this, uh, want people to have a complete historical ignorance, to treat these things as like just hypotheticals, well, maybe we could create the situation when there is just like an endless track record of U.S. intervention and what it does to the country and how it sets it on a path backwards from where it is and becomes the main barrier to anything ever moving forward in the country. Mm. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And, and to me, it's really one of the things that gets... <laughs> I mean, I hate to say that it seems obvious, but it's as if people think that there are no consequences for imperialism. I mean, they look and they say, oh, well, this looks so terrible. Well, what did you expect? I mean, you go in, you completely destroy the country, you build up an unbelievably corrupt, uh, and, and we know, I mean, it's not that we don't even know these things are going on. I mean, it's very clear. I, I think anyone who's been paying attention to Afghanistan for the past three years, the Taliban has been taking more and more territory. It's not as if this is randomly happening. And then people in the media, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. What's going on? You know, you had Frederick Kagan in the New York Times. Oh, he could have won, but he didn't, which reminds me of <laughs> that terrible Max Boot book, the Small Wars book, where he's like, we could have won Vietnam, but we didn't. Even almost the Max ties Boot. to the Saigon thing. I mean, that to me is is deep because it's almost like That's they're saying, yeah, the like we never should have left Vietnam either. And I mean, it's certainly, I agree with you, Rania. It's, I mean, the Taliban compared to the People's Army of it's Volunteers right. of, of no. uh, Vietnam, the People's Army of Vietnam. <laughs> that was no the good connection. guys actually winning. <laughs> yeah. And there was also, by the way, uh, op ed in, in the New York Times today, sort of making this parallel, not directly, it was by the guy who wrote The Defector which is an interesting book in and of itself, but, um, you know, making the same kind of parallel, like, well, maybe we doing the right thing in Vietnam. I mean, it's, just, it's all this sort of soft pro-imperialism that even if it didn't work out, you know, we kind of had the right move. And I feel like that's so much of what's happening now is that there's so much, you know, faux surprise amongst politicians, in the media, as if somehow this was not, in many ways, a predictable set of consequences when you look at both the goals well, and the way this thing has been carried out. I also want to add to that before we get Mike's take that, you know, Mike, you mentioned when you first came on um, that one of the reasons Afghanistan wasn't getting so much attention was because American soldiers were dying, weren't dying. And that wasn't by accident because over the last few years under Trump, when he was when his team, particularly Zalmay Khalilzad, was negotiating this uh ultimate withdrawal from Afghanistan, the negotiations were completely sidestepping and undermining the government the U.S. had been propping up for 20 years uh, and going directly to the Taliban and essentially saying to them, look, you can attack Afghan forces, you just can't attack us. Right. And that's exactly what they did. So this is what actually I found very uh, offensive about Joe Biden's speech uh, after the big debacle in Kabul was the way he blamed it on Afghans, the way he, he said, well, we can't fight and die in a war that Afghans aren't even willing to fight and die for. Actually, they have been fighting and dying for your stupid war in the tens of thousands. Like, and, and so, so much so, it's like an unsustainable level of dying for any force that seeks to be the security forces of a country. Um, and furthermore, you know, I. I I actually think there's an argument to be made that, of course, Ashraf Ghani is a terrible person and he, you know, fled uh, because he has a foreign passport and he's awful. But as for the Afghan forces in the country, especially in Kabul, and every and how Joe Biden said, oh, they weren't willing to fight. Well, actually, one could look at it as they avoided bloodshed because had they fought, there would have been a civil war right now. There would have been a catastrophe, a catastrophic loss of life. Uh, in major cities across Afghanistan had they chosen 
to take their weapons and actually fight the Taliban. So in many respects, what did happen is actually because the U.S. handed the country over to the Taliban uh, and had this, you know, created this government and these security forces that were so dependent on American firepower that once the U.S. left, they like couldn't really do much because that's the situation that the U.S. created. One could say that the Afghan forces actually made the best decision here for the people in these cities. Yeah, the best decision if you don't want to die fighting a battle that you know you're bound to lose. I mean, I mean, it just shows right. kind of the uh, the people that wield so much control over how many people will live or die. I mean, the politicians in Washington who decide to make war and decide if there's going to be more soldiers, where we're going to bomb, whatever. The, the idea that the people that have the power to make those decisions, that decide life and death for millions of people, populations of millions of people, that their logic was just, oh, well, the Afghan army has 300,000 soldiers and the Taliban have like 75,000 soldiers. So the math works out. Like, of course, Afghanistan is not going to fall to the Taliban. And they're just lying completely on this outside of any context uh, in the country. I mean, one of them, of course, as you mentioned, was the fact that the, the, the puppet forces set up by the United States were just, when you have puppet forces, they're completely dependent on the puppet master. And so why right. did the Taliban, how is the Taliban able to take over every provincial capital in the matter of a week, really just walking right in? It's because as part of the US, US withdrawal deal, you know, they, they said they would stop doing the airstrikes. Um, of course, there were some residual airstrikes like the B-52 bomber that, that Biden had to prevent the Taliban takeover of a single city for like three more days. He did this bombing mm -hmm. and killed over 20 civilians you know, committing war crimes like bombing a school, bombing a medical clinic. Um, you know, a, a great encapsulation of the senseless violence, doing this bombing on a civilian population just to prevent the takeover of a city for like three more days, like maybe for to get to make the media coverage stay in the way that he wanted it. Um, but once you had the elimination of U.S. airstrikes, uh, the Taliban could just walk into these cities. And why would the Afghan forces, which, of course, as you mentioned, Rania, were sustaining a huge number of casualties in fighting with the Taliban, like a lot. And, you know, nobody really wants to be in a losing battle. And so if they were taking a lot of casualties with U.S. air support, that was coming in and just leveling in the areas where Taliban fighters were around them. As soon as you lose that air support um, and you know that you have a good chance that you're probably going to lose the battle and be completely overrun, killed and captured by the Taliban. And then you have, you know, Ashraf Ghani fleeing the country. I think that surprised <laughs> a lot of Americans, but I guarantee you that didn't surprise any Afghan soldiers. I mean, so the idea that you would kind of fight and die for a government that you know was rich, probably going to leave with millions of dollars anyway, you know, over a hundred million dollars actually. Um, you know, it's it's no surprise that they collapsed so quickly. But the other piece that I think is maybe the bigger one that the Pentagon thinking, oh, they got three hundred thousand soldiers, why wouldn't they fight to to stop the Taliban from taking over <laughs> Kabul? One thing that the Pentagon can't really wrap their mind around, uh, you know, the Pentagon which just loves war, is that maybe the Afghan soldiers didn't want to be at war anymore. Um, and maybe that mm -hmm. they saw the Taliban insurgency and the other many different militias and stuff that affiliated with them and were fighting occupation forces and Afghan puppet forces, um, that maybe they saw them as their countrymen, that they had some shared culture, shared religion, some commonality, and that they didn't actually want to fight them anymore. And they wanted to cooperate and have peace. Um, I think that you can go and look up in 2018, there was a ceasefire between the Afghan army and the Taliban um, for, for many weeks. And what happened in this ceasefire? You had the Taliban come into these city centers and they celebrated Eid with the Afghan army. There's all these photos of Taliban and Afghan army people holding hands, dancing together, eating together. I mean, there was almost like celebrations in the streets throughout Afghanistan because these people who were from the same country being forced to fight each other, the reason that they were having to fight each other was because the existence of this NATO occupation. And that was really, mm -hmm. that was really the barrier to the, to the fighting stopping. Um, and so the, for the U.S., a civil war was very much in their interest. And we're already seeing the United States, like, I think they're going to gauge uh, how friendly the Taliban government is going to be. If the Taliban government is going to be friendly to Western interests, allowing business contracts and, you know, collaborating on counterterrorism and all the things that they asked for in this, uh, this deal, um, you know, that you'll see the U.S. kind of very quickly develop 
friendly relations with the with the Afghan government. Mm-hmm. But if the uh, Taliban government uh, appear like they were in the 90s as uncooperative, as barriers, as favoring chi- relations with China and Russia over the United States, then you will very much see not only kind of economic pressure through sanctions, you know, seizing money from the banks and things like that, but pu- again, putting money into funding civil conflict in the country, forces that oppose the Taliban, pouring money and weapons into them to kind of create uh, you know, a state of war artificially through foreign intervention, just as the last 20 years have done. Shout out to Animosity through $20 there into the Super Chat. No comment, just donating, and I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I guess it does bring me to a, another point, though, Mike, and, and just the way we think about this. I mean, to me, they were never winning, the United States, right? I mean, they were really just forestalling the inevitable. I, I mean, there have been so many articles over the years about you know what was really going on in Afghanistan and what was happening. You've got places that are allegedly controlled by the government, but then, you know, like at night, the Taliban was coming in and running their own judicial system. You know what I mean? And I think this is not rare. I mean, this is actually common when you look at military occupations like this. The same thing is true in the Sahel, uh, in Africa, certainly. You know, the same thing was true in Vietnam, where you can use a certain set of presence in urban areas to create the illusion that you have a viable political project rather than a colonial occupation. And for years, they've really just been forestalling the inevitable. I mean, I think that's why so many people have been uh, frustrated about the ongoing nature of the war, because you can see the money going out, you can see the tens of thousands of people who are dying, you can see the massive spike in uh, heroin being sold, because people forget that. I remember we were also supposed to be taking out the, the poppy seeds, but of course now it's higher than it's ever been, that to some degree there has been, and I think this was in the Afghanistan papers, Douglas Lute, the general, basically saying, we didn't know what we were doing. We had no idea what was going on. We were just doing whatever. And I feel like there's been this new fiction created that, like, at some point, you know, we really had them going. You know, we really had them on the run (laughs) rather than really just having had a status quo of extreme violence that was only maintained by extreme violence. And to me, that's why it collapsed so quickly, because it was always a very hollow uh, uh, construct. Yeah, well, the, the point in the Afghanistan war where the U.S. like really tried to win uh, was the troop surge under Obama. And that was just a complete and utter disaster, a total defeat of U.S. forces on the ground, which is a big history to get to get into. But, um, you know, places like Korangal Valley, Winat Valley are really emblematic uh, of that phase of just small U.S. positions just basically holding themselves off from being completely overrun by lots of Taliban fighters on a daily basis and only being saved through the massive air support that the U.S. was able to fly in to prevent these bases from being overrun. But extreme high number of casualties during this during the surge. You know, I think that you're right. The Afghanistan papers are definitely the most important chapter of the Afghanistan war because it revealed that for most of the duration of the war, uh, behind the scenes, there is a complete acknowledgement that the U.S. had lost militarily and could not win. And then when they found themselves in a state of military defeat, um, instead of admitting defeat and leaving, like would be the right thing or the sane thing to do, um, or not only did they not do that, but they didn't even develop, I mean, if you care about, like if anyone who cares about like, oh, maybe we should have tried harder to win, they didn't even like come up with a way to win. They were just, it was fine for them to drag on. Generals switch out every few months. You know, can no commander really has to take responsibility. And so you're right. The revelation of the Afghanistan paper was they were internally saying like, yeah, we don't even have a strategy anymore. We're just kind of like here and, and going through the motions. And that characterized most of the war, um, which was fine for them because the generals cycle in and out of the base in Afghanistan. They get, you know, just for sitting on a main base in Kabul, they'll get, you know, a silver star or some medal for valor. Uh, pinned on their chest. They'll get a couple extra stripes on their uniform for combat experience, even though they just sat back on a main base and probably never put on a a body armor or a helmet. Um, And then all of that adds to their resume. So when they get out of the military, you know, and and then, you know, take a week vacation and then go straight to becoming an executive or a lobbyist or a member of a corporate board for the same defense industries that they gave contracts to when they were in the Pentagon, you know, making six, sometimes seven figure salaries, salaries based on how much uh, command experience they have in battle. So it's great for them to go to Iraq and Afghanistan a bunch of times. You know, there was no incentive for them to end it because, you know, generals um, 
Generals weren't going on patrols where people were getting their legs blown off every day. You know, they, were, they weren't having to deal with any of that. And the politicians in Washington, it was the same thing. And it's good to have a big excuse for a big military budget. They're making their, uh, the defense industry happy and all of that stuff. So there is no, even from that standpoint of inside the establishment, a complete acknowledgement that not only were we losing, but weren't even trying to, to figure out some kind of solution. They were happy to just drag it out. Um, it was great for the military industrial complex. It was great for the military, which got to just vastly expand its its technological arsenal. Um, and there was no pressure on them because, um, of course, there were Americans dying, but not enough for it to be a scandal like it was during the troop surge or the, the height of the Iraq war. And, you know, I don't think that they expected that. I mean, I think there is a lot of speculation that the U.S. wanted to get into an endless quagmire because it was good for the military industrial complex. I think that they made the best out of the situation that they were handed for for the MIC, for capitalism. Um, But they actually thought it was going to be easy. And if you look back at uh, wars uh, of the U.S. over the past, you know, 40 or 50 years, you know, you had the major defeat in Korea, you had the major defeat in Vietnam. But then there's this period prior to 9-11 where the U.S. has all these small interventions. You know, they're in Panama, they're in Grenada, they're doing these little overthrows. There's not a lot of U.S. casualties. They accomplish their mission. You had the Gulf War, which was like the next big war that the U.S. waged in the 90s, where you had a big, large invasion of like 100,000 American troops. You know, almost no American soldiers died at the hands of Iraqi forces. All the soldiers that died were killed by American forces that accidentally killed them, um, like, you know, over 100 or so. Um, And so in the consciousness of the the commanders in the Pentagon, you know, losing and losing Korea, that was so far in the past. And they thought now our military is so technologically advanced. We have precision guided missiles. We have night vision goggles. We have uh, armored vehicles. We have so many things that we are invincible in battle. And if we roll into Afghanistan, if we roll into Iraq, of course we're going to die. Of course we're going to win the war. The Taliban is no match for us. The Iraqi army is no match for us. And they just arrogantly thought they could stroll into these countries, quickly overthrow the government, set up a pupper government, and just through their military prowess, uh, prevent prevent anyone from challenging that. And they were going to move on to Iran and Lebanon and Syria and all these other countries where they wanted regime change and thought they could do it through brute military force. And they literally, they did not anticipate the reality that people don't want to live under foreign occupation, which is kind of like the most common sense thing there is. I mean, if you asked any American, for the most part, what they would do if a foreign army invaded and was occupying their neighborhood, a a vast majority of them, I would say, they would say they take the gun out of their closet and start shooting at them. Um, And so just the the sheer arrogance that they thought that they could do this without any kind of resistance. um, And then that led to them being dealt two military defeats in two countries that had vastly inferior technological capacity, even less people to fight. Um, and it just kind of, uh, you know, that was, that was the result of just kind of hubris and arrogance of, of couple rich politicians and a handful of generals who just, you know, took their uniform off and then put on a suit and then went to making mm. seven-figure salaries. Yeah, that's right. The revolving door is, I mean, you know, uh, one element of this that, I mean, it's really the element of all the aspects of the government, but a really disgusting one, I think, when you see they they launder their reputations. And the ones that don't go into the private sector then go into academia. I remember when David Petraeus was, you know, yeah. briefly at CUNY. I think he actually might be at Yale now. And I, I think it was in the Yale class they actually banned people taking notes because they didn't want, and like, you know, they were checking people for recorders and all these other things because, you know, I think they probably had a sense that people might challenge him in the class and or maybe he'd let something slip, but they didn't want to have an actual back and forth between these students and these generals and have someone record it and then have it come out, you know, with, with you know, what these people are really thinking. Of course, we know Petraeus being one of these people. And one thing I just want to say really quickly I'm really glad you made the point about the technological piece, Mike, because I think one thing that we've almost forgotten, I mean, they invented this new robot warfare. We call it drone warfare now. But I mean, they really invented this whole new form of, of extremely destructive and even more impersonal and thus 
Some might say easier to carry out, although I think we see drone pilots are facing, you know, quite a bit of PTSD and the like, but, you know, almost this video game-like thing. But now this whole robot warfare of drones has spread around the entire world, and the rules of engagement, which we can go anywhere and kill anyone at any time, have been adopted by many other countries. And I think that is a notable factor of this, is that they, they really did develop a whole new arena and form of war out of this occupation in Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's another reason why dragging the war out was good for U.S. imperialism, because all of this, all of these extra funds, I mean, like the top five defense contractors um, saw their government contracts like quadruple mm. as soon as the war on terror started. And today their government contracts are, those are still intact. They're not going to lose them um, because the, the war in Afghanistan has wrapped up. Um, so there is like this spigot of just a, an unlimited flow of American taxpayer dollars to go into the defense industry. This wasn't always for, oh, we need this many trucks. We got to buy these trucks. It was so much was just for like research and development, come up with new weapons. And, and, and it's, it's such a racket. Like, you know, it's funny because like if you were in the DC subway, like you see ads in the DC subway for like new pieces of military equipment, yeah. like oh, a new right. armored vehicle, yeah. like a new tank, like who was like, so Who's weird. like buying a tank? Well, it's it's because the the people who work in the Pentagon <laughs> take the subway, and they're like, oh, that, you know, that looks like yeah. a cool vehicle. I'm gonna call those guys up, <laughs> have them come give the presentation at the office, and then the company comes and they're like, you know what? Cool, we'll give you ten billion dollars. Uh, give us a bunch of these vehicles, and then uh, that establishes a good relationship with with that general who gave them the contract, and then it's a lasting relationship. They come on as a consultant later, as a lobbyist for the company, going to Congress and saying, hey, you know what? As a general, I worked with these people and they gave us this great vehicle. So here's why you should buy their product. I mean, it's a complete and total racket that only like accelerates a militism around the world as, as like there's no ants, you know, like, oh, the U.S. is going to develop this new generation of drones <laughs> uh, as if it's going to give it this advantage over the world. And then every other imperialist country is just going to be like, OK, you know, we're going to do the same thing. And then it's just like leads to this completely senseless arms race that, of course, the U.S. Uh, is the center of. Um, and yeah, you know, it's interesting that even with all of that, um, it just didn't matter on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but it was fine I was for actually... U.S. corporations. Mm -hmm, go ahead. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna note that that was what was amazing about the the pullout is that it, the U.S. was it was such a uh, debacle for them because their intelligence is so bad because the intelligence community doesn't actually know anything. They don't know what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan. They were like, I mean, the predictions were like. They were like, we predict in three months to the Taliban will take right. most of the country. Then it was like, we predict in 30 days and now we're rushing to get our staff out. And four days later, the Taliban took Kabul. And it really makes you realize like they don't know what's happening on the ground in Syria or Iraq or any of these yeah. other countries either. Most actually and part of that is probably because not that they ever really knew, but part of it is also because of this dependent on this like robot warfare technology now where you're just you're like gathering intelligence with drones like that's what the a lot of the u.s uh military apparatus does now uh so yeah they don't know what's going on anywhere which is actually kind of soothing to my soul in a way <laughs> yeah no, every, military intelligence is the biggest oxymoron it's the hmm. it's a saying in the military um and you know I, it has historical precedent i mean there's a reason why uh so many officers were killed by their own soldiers in the vietnam war um, it's because they were the they were the brains behind the operation, and they did, and they sucked. Um, and that's part of the legacy of the Afghanistan War too. Is there was even though it didn't manifest in the same way as it did for uh, in the Iraq War, where you had hundreds of soldiers who were refusing to fight in Iraq and becoming anti-war activists. Like there was a it was a di had a different character in the Afghanistan War. But there was even though it didn't manifest as political action. There was so much discontent among the rake and file soldiers in the Afghanistan war because they could see clearly that their commanders, even down to like the, you know, the lower levels, like company levels, um, the officers that were running everything had no idea what they were doing. And that's why a lot of people were dying on, on both sides. Um, and it, it was just kind of like one of the characteristic, uh, uh, pieces of history of the Afghanistan war is the soldiers that were sent out, you know, out to be in the middle of nowhere or back on the bases doing training. It was obvious to them that those at the top 
didn't know what they were doing, getting a lot of people killed for absolutely no reason. And so you see these little, there were all these little acts of rebellion from like true believer soldiers who like joined after 9-11 to go to Afghanistan to fight the Taliban and then got there and, and like had different ways of speaking out and um, trying to draw attention to, to the situation so that, that the war would end. Um, you know, many of them didn't, didn't survive. People that came out publicly on the record talking about how we, you know, all these patrols are completely pointless. We're killing people and getting people, uh, their legs blown off every single day for absolutely no reason, except these generals want to say, hey, look, we've got some dots on a map. That's where our soldiers are. We're winning the war. Look at all the, the provinces <laughs> that we occupy. Um, so those people dumb. coming out and blowing the whistle on it to Congress and things like that. And then a week later, getting blown up by an ID, IED themselves and killed. So, you know, that's a that's an important piece of the thing also. Even like the the Bo, I mean, everyone remembers this Bo Bergdahl thing where like the mm -hmm. soldier fled and was captured by the Taliban and there's this prisoner, all that stuff. You know, the a piece of that story that's missing is why Bo Bergdahl left his base and ended up being captured by the Taliban is because it was like an act of protest. He was trying to trigger this big scandal that that let the higher leadership know that there was just complete debacle on the ground where they were, and it was just complete chaos because of the officers that were in charge of them. It was like a rebellion against the battalion and lower level commanders to try to get them all investigated by the higher command. And so, like I said, even though it didn't manifest as like anti-war activity, like soldiers who were in Iraq did, um, there are these very significant, you know, rebellions and speaking out that happened throughout it, which of course will be left off the official record of the Afghanistan war. Yeah, you know, I mean, it just seems like the upshot of all of this, Mike, really is, you know, the root of this issue is imperialism, that nothing good mm -hmm. can come out of trying to control, occupy, uh, and browbeat the world to follow what a handful of people on Wall unless, Street and in Washington, D.C. I want. was going to say, it depends which side you sit on, unless That's you're fair. like the weapons contractor the and you're like, I'm buying relations. myself a new penthouse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, but yeah, I know it's, it's, it's actually disgusting. It's disgusting. The level of wealth that was gained from so much destruction. Yeah. And I think now that, now that the war has an end cap, you know, now that it can be wrapped up, it's bookended, you could look at it in its entirety, 2001 to 2021, what happened? And the same way we can look at the Iraq war, you know, if you, of course the Iraq war continues in some form, but the real American occupation of Iraq, um, and and the the period of counterinsurgency or whatever. I mean, we can look at those two pieces of history as as complete pictures. And I hope that that really gets remembered for people, um, especially people who think about joining the military or have family that think about joining the military or who are in the military and are you know are going to be called up when the U.S. decides to go to war with someone else. Because what now that we have these wars bookended and wrapped up in some capacity we can see uh, a pattern and experience of what this government uh, does. You know, this government that cares to claim so much about people around the world and, of course, its own soldiers. I mean, it's such a piece of American culture of, like, worshiping members of the military. You know, like, these, these politicians, I mean, they get their photo taken at veteran cemeteries every year. I mean, it's, it's such a part of, like, the propaganda is that the politicians, like, love their soldiers so much. But what was the, ex <laughs> what was the overall experience of the Afghanistan war and the Iraq war. We know now that number one, they will lie about why we're going and we'll just lie to you about why we have to invade these countries. What they acknowledge privately and what they say to the public is completely different. So they will lie to you about why we have to go. All of their, number two is all their rhetoric about uh, bringing human rights and, and we're doing this because we care about the people that we're going to save. In fact, they will unleash extreme brutality, commit an endless list of war crimes, subject people to humiliating occupation. So anyone who thinks that you're gonna be going and helping people, you'll be doing the exact opposite. Um, you know, and then when the war starts going badly for them, like it did with Iraq, like with Afghanistan, when it turns out that it blew up in their face and shows that they didn't know what they were getting into and it turned into a disaster, what are they gonna do then? Are they gonna say, oh, this turned into a disaster, let's, let's stop more people from dying and get out of there? No, they'll lie and just throw, throw more and more bodies into the meat grinder so even more people die simply because they don't wanna take responsibility for uh, a failure. They're just gonna dump more bodies into it because it's not their kids, it's not their neighbors. Then uh, the people that are affected by the war both the, and we saw this clearly with the, the Kabul airport tarmac, um, but even with their own soldiers, the people that are affected, that they send to the war, that they send into the meat grinder, when they need help, 
they they throw them away like a piece of garbage. That's why you saw the what yeah. happened to the, the people in Afghanistan right now. Um, and soldiers came back to a suicide epidemic where the government said, uh, you know what, we're actually going to punish you if you try to seek mental health care. And we're going to send you back to Iraq and Afghanistan a bunch of times. Um, and if you kill yourself, you know, that's that's your fault. You know, the skyrocketing rate of veterans homelessness. And so these politicians that they say they care so much about you um, and the people of the countries they're going to invade and occupy, treat them all like garbage as soon as they're done using them. Um, and and so that's, and at all the while, all while that's happening, uh, these small group of people at the top are making an insane, a really lavish amount of money, super profits off of the war. It's easy for them to drag it out. And then all of the people that were your commanders, um, they're going to do okay also, because they're going to go making, you know, like, as we said, go make a few million dollars just you know, hawking the different products that these companies make with their, you know, medals for valor that they got on those main big bases where they are in no danger at all. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you coming on. Obviously, there's so much. We could talk so much about this. We're going to continue have to keep talking about this. Obviously, uh, it's an important piece of news and important lessons that we need to learn. But really appreciate everything you all do on the Empire Files as well. So thanks for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Of course. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Well, Rania, that brings us to where we normally do. I want to say, sorry, Vanessa Norris and Southern Comrade both donated. We got a little caught up there, a lot happening. Sorry, uh, we miss you there. But thank you so much for your donations. Uh, as our censor, Rania, pointed out earlier, you can also go to patreon.com slash breakthrough news, patreon.com slash breakthrough news <laughs> if you want to become a patron and continue to support, you know, all of the work that... Uh, you know, we we put out there uh, in everything that we're doing. I know, Vanessa, you were asking about organizations to support in Afghanistan on the ground. I'll be honest with you, I don't really know, you know, with any exact thing to tell you where you can spend your money, where it won't get stolen. Uh, I, I can that, tell you one. Please. I mean, I can tell you one thing. I, I, I actually agree with you, Jen. I'm not sure either where you can. I, we, I have to like look into that. I'm not sure who to who you should be giving your money to when it comes to NGOs. You never know what's right, what's wrong. I feel like. Red Cross, UNICEF stuff is always good for the most part, but except also, you know, there's refuge, except in Haiti, but there are, there are also, um, the issue of refugees coming to new countries. Like I know that my family in the U S has been gathering together clothes that they can give to incoming Afghan refugees. So that's one way that you can help in a more immediate way where you actually like know where your, where your money or your clothing or whatever you're donating is going to like locally. I'm not sure where you live. Vanessa, but if it's in the States or another Western country where that's accepting Afghan refugees, that's one way you could help. And I promise to look into that and ask people who would know and I'll like post it on Twitter or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah the other yeah. comment, Go ahead. the other comment was from Southern was from Southern comrade, uh, quite a hefty donation. Thank you, Southern comrade. Uh, and he said that he disagree or he or she actually, I'm sorry. I just assumed um, or they uh, disagree with Mike. U.S. didn't botch the Afghan withdrawal. The hurried departure was designed to create a power vacuum, cause civil war, and destabilize Iran, China, and Russia. Huge fan of the Empire Files, though. I've seen some people suggest that. You know, I interviewed Mohammed Mirandi, the Iranian professor, uh, on my show a couple days ago, and that was his take, too. He, he believes the U.S. intentionally withdrew in the worst way possible uh, in an effort to cause a chaotic, unstable situation of war that would negatively impact Afghanistan's neighbors, which include China, Russia, and Iran, America's favorite countries in the world. Uh, sir, anything, anything's possible. Certainly yeah, possible. I don't know. I don't know if I agree, uh, though, because I don't know if I buy that. they were yeah. already, dis I mean, I mean, you know, the existence of the war for all that time, for instance, the East Turkestan Islamic movement was, you know, nurtured there in Afghanistan right. and launching attacks in China. Obviously, the issues with Iran and the Taliban and al-Qaeda are longstanding and go far back for some elements and have played a significant part there in Western Iran and 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 others in, in Russia. So, I mean, you know, who knows? I guess you're right. Anything is possible. Yeah. I, mean, I tend possible. to think that yeah. they were in a completely unwinnable situation. Um, they had right. no viable political project they could support. It was one of the most unpopular interventions or political policies of all in the United States. It was obviously uh, making it difficult for them in many ways. And of course, you know, as we've seen over the past 10 or so years, this idea of pivoting towards Asia and rebalancing U.S. troops. And I think to a lesser extent, but an important extent in Africa as well, when we look at how AFRICOM was combined with European command. But, 
Either way, I appreciate the donation. Appreciate all of your uh, viewership in terms of uh, being here with us on the show. So thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Southern Comrade. Thanks to everybody who watched. And thank to all of our guests, as always. We'll be back with you again next week. We will be looking forward to it here on the Freedom Side. Gets in its way.